Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Barbara Suits. I am the Open Educational Resources and Instructional Materials Program Manager here at OSPI. And I am joined by a number of my excellent colleagues at OSPI and also some, uh, some wonderful grantees who are going to be showing you all of the, uh, the really hard work that they have been doing over the course of, of this last year. I am joining you today from Olympia, Washington. That is the traditional tribal lands of the Squaxin Island people. If you happen to know the nearest tribal neighbor to where you're located, go ahead and pop that into the chat window and let's see if we can see what representation we have from across the state. Looks like we have a few from Puyallup, Nisqually. Excellent. And feel free to continue typing in, but we're gonna go ahead and move on. So um, just so we have kind of a, a common frame for um, the, the project that we're talking about today. <clears throat> the K-12 OER project uh, is really focused on the development of uh, instructional materials, especially in, in content areas that are lacking in standards aligned OER. Um, and that's really what this grant is focused on. It is providing seed monies to, to districts and organizations that are going to be creating um, instructional materials that can be shared broadly with educators across the state and around the world. If you're not familiar with OER, the acronym stands for Open Educational Resources. These are materials that are free, but even more importantly, have uh, certain permissions that you can take advantage of. Most importantly for our K-12 community is really that ability to revise content, to adapt and to contextualize and make it relevant to our students. Um, another really important permission that we're finding is the ability to retain content. So it is not just out there for access on the internet, but it's something that you can download, you can bring into your own LMS, um, you can control copies of the content so you're not dependent on an internet connection in order to have access. Next slide, please. All of the grantees that you're going to be hearing from today and all of the resources that they are creating are all located on our Washington OER Hub. This is our online platform um, for sharing standards aligned content with educators across the state. If you are not familiar with the Washington OER Hub, I am going to put a link into the chat window right now. And you are welcome to visit there at, at any time, but do know that all of the resources that we talk about today will be accessed um, by clicking on that uh, link to go to the Washington Hub and, uh, and searching for the resources there. And each of the individual grantees will tell you specifically where their resources are located. Some have individual groups, others are located in uh, a group for grantees, but all of them can be found just by clicking on that search hub resources bar and typing in the name of the resource and that will bring it right up. Next slide, please, Holly. All right. Well, with that, I'm gonna stop talking because what I'd really like to do is devote uh, the rest of our time together to our grantees who will be talking about the, uh, the great work that they have been doing over the course of the year. Uh, Kicking us off, we have Kathy Corrado, who's gonna be speaking to us about the work that the Washington Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Youth have been working on. Kathy, over to you. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, can we play the first couple of minutes and I'll just show this and then I'll explain what it means? I'm Sean Broderick. I work at CDHY doing outreach. Today we'll discuss debit cards. A debit card is free to use. You must have money available in your checking account. 
Then you can make purchases, which will subtract from that account. Debit cards have no interest rate. You don't have to pay any interest on debit card purchases. When you get a debit card, there are three things to look for. First, your account number. It may match your checking account number. Second, the expiration date. When your expiration date gets close, your bank should send you a new card. If you haven't gotten your new one, contact your bank and let them know. Third, on the back of your card is usually a three number code. It's a private code called your CVC. You should not share it with anyone. There are three main ways to use your debit card. First, at an ATM. You go, type in your PIN number. And I'm going to go ahead and pause it there. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's more than enough. So that's basically what it is. There's going to be 15 altogether, all slowly stepping out what it's like uh, to be enough to be financially literate for deaf and hard of hearing students. So I'm a, I work for the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Youth, which is a state agency. I'm a teacher of the deaf by I'm trained teacher of the deaf and I taught for many years. One of the things I see, I travel around the state working with districts and families and students and teachers and special ed teachers. I'm working with deaf and hard of hearing students. And one of the things that we saw prevalent is high school, middle school and high school deaf students have no idea about finances. Uh, they have no financial literacy. So what we did is we wrote something and explained briefly, um, we got together with some teachers um, who do this and we came up with 15 videos that needed to be made. Uh, we started with simple needs and wants. We start, then we went into things like what's a paycheck? What are those, all those deductions mean? When they say you get $15 an hour, you're really not getting $15 an hour. Um, uh, we went to debit cards, credit unions, uh, loans. What, uh, what does it cost to live on your own? Independent living skills. You know, can you, how many roommates do you want? And um, so six of them are currently uploaded on OER. Um, each one is also, it's, they're all presented in American Sign Language. Um, one will have English voiceover and one will have Spanish. So all six are both English and in Spanish. You can search CDHY they'll come up with along with some other videos that we made about deaf people at their jobs so you can see them working and then we have nine more left we finished filming them now we have to uh, we're editing them putting the captioning on and then we're doing the um spanish and the english voiceovers there they really take financial literacy and bring it down to a level that um, students can understand especially special needs students it really breaks down. Is it cheaper to go to Starbucks or McDonald's or make coffee at home? Is it cheaper to go to Red Robin, uh, Burger King, or buy the food and cook it at home? It's all those kind of comparisons about what's it like to live once you're out of your family's house? What does rent mean? What is first and last rent? All those things that deaf kids really don't understand or other special ed students. It's really excited to, these are going not just, they're going all over the United States, which is really fascinating that uh, other states are looking for them. Teachers are currently using the first six in classrooms and students are loving them. And their parents can access them. Um, we're pretty excited. We have some ideas for even more videos. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity. All right, next up we have Terry Farrar. Uh, if you would like to uh, tell us a little bit about the project that you've been working on with Shape Washington. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Terry Farrar. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology at Pacific Lutheran University, as well as the assessment chairperson for Shape Washington. And with me today is Gail C., the executive director of Shape Washington. 
Um, so our project was a collaboration between Shape Washington and the Department of Kinesiology. Um, our project was on developing unit plans and lesson plans using the teaching games for understanding teaching model. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we're using a, a different uh, teaching model. So traditional skill themes approach is a teaching, um, kind of the typical teaching physical education approach to teach skills in isolation and eventually put them into a game situation. Uh, the TGFU model uses this modified game, then a practice and a modified game approach. So students see right away why they need to learn the skill and they start to think tactically as to how they can use the skill within the game. So you see there on the slide that the TGFU model really increases student motivation. It uh, helps the student understand the game itself. And it also increases the uh, physical activity intensity in students through research we have discovered that. The lessons are going to align with OSPI state physical education um, uh, and grade level outcomes. We focused on standards one, two, four, and five. Standard three focuses on fitness, and there are some components of, of our lessons that will definitely um, hit those uh, standard three components as well. It just wasn't really a focus of, of what we wanted to um, look at. Lessons are also going to align with the uh, SEL learning standards, benchmarks, and indicators. So what we did with this is that we've developed units and lesson plans were developed for uh, one invasion game and one net game in the three grade bands there on the slide. And uh, what I'll show you today is we have unit examples for uh, fist ball, tooth ball, and spike ball. So next slide, please. We chose games that were um, kind of not common in the typical physical education class. So. Um, people may not be familiar with fist ball and tooth ball. Spike ball is pretty popular, um, but fist ball actually comes from Europe. It's uh, similar to volleyball with three contacts on a side, but the fist ball can actually bounce uh, once on the floor before a student makes contact with it. So especially at the elementary level, it really takes away that fear of this, this ball flying at their face and uh, really not knowing what to do with it or, or being afraid to be able to um, pass it before it, it bounces on the floor. So with this particular game, that is a good component of it. I'm looking at the unit plan there. Um, with the TGFU model, you'll notice that in the activities and games column that the first and last, last activity are the same each day. And as we play that initial game, we don't give very many rules. There's no real explanation of how the game should be played. So it's somewhat of an exploratory experience for the students also, so they can kind of figure out what may work for them. The initial game is usually only five to eight minutes long. And then after the initial game, we ask students what kind of skills or strategies they use that work, what didn't work. So they've got some critical thinking going on as well. And then the students have opportunities to learn and practice the skills needed for success. Um, and then they, they usually play the same game uh, to end the lesson so they can see more success as they're able to apply what they've learned in the lesson. So this is a week one of a two week unit and week two would focus on defensive strategies, more communication and would end with a uh, two day kind of small game tournament. At the middle school level, uh, we're playing uh, tooth ball and there on the slide you see the seventh grade standards. So we included standards for sixth and eighth grade as well. But for this example, I just included the um, seventh grade standards. Tooth ball actually comes from Switzerland. Um, and really the throwing and catching are integral parts of it. You can see the uh, picture there up in the right hand corner. Essentially what happens is that um, two teams, student throws off of the tooth net and um, the goal is, is that you want to throw it at just kind of strange angles or um, uh, with kind of a, a lot of force or not as much force. And essentially what happens is that you don't want the defense to catch it off of the net. Um, defense doesn't really happen in tooth ball. There's no guarding of anyone. Uh, you can't intercept any passes. So it's a very fast paced game. And you can also throw off of the same tooth net multiple times. So it's just, it's a very different um, activity. Next slide, please. 
with the um, units there, you're going to see this is a three week unit. This is week two. Um, we really get quickly into um, kind of the uh, well, kind of into the core of the game. So week one, we do work on fundamental skills, but then it really gets into that court awareness, the rebounding offensive defensive strategies. Week three, there's more offensive and defensive tactics with a, a three day tournament. But again, you're kind of seeing how um, we start and we end with the same activity each day. Again, with the concept being that the students are, are being able to learn the skill better in between and then apply it in that, in that last game. Next slide. Thank you. So spike ball is at the high school level. Spike ball originated here in the United States. Um, it just didn't gain much, much interest early on. It wasn't um, until 2015 that it really gained the popularity it currently has. And that was due to, um, because it appeared on the TV show Shark Tank um, is really where it got its, its uh, kind of following. So spike ball is um, typically played by two teams of two students. So as you can see there in the picture of the students, you've got um, kind of two V2 is, is what you're looking at. And then um, they have three alternating touches to return the spike ball to the net. The nice thing about spike ball or the interesting thing about it is that once the serve is made, um, you can hit and move in any direction that you want. So it's literally a 360 degrees of play. Um, you, you're going to start on a side of a net and you're facing your opponents, but as soon as that serve's made, uh, kind of all bets are off. You are, you're moving in all directions. So it's really um, an interesting game in that aspect of it. The unit plan itself, again, this is a three week unit. Um, first week we're, we're working again on, on uh, kind of some basic fundamental skills, but there's always a lot of gameplay within the TGFU model uh, because that's really what students wanna do. They wanna come into the, into the class and play. And so this model gets them right into um, that method of play right away. Uh, next slide, please. So these next three slides are going to show you just what the lesson plan would look like. So first page of it is kind of the, the typical lesson plan. The next page is showing you really the TGFU model itself. So we've got the set induction, the initial game, the questions, and then the two practice tasks. The third uh, page of the lesson plan, again, goes back to that application game and then a closure. Throughout all of these, there's um, assessments each day. The uh, assessments are either cognitive, affective, or psychomotor assessments. And some days will have a, a, um, two, at least two uh, assessments during the day. And every day also has differentiating instruction for the different games that are played and for the different activities. Uh, in between the two games. And then just to kind of close, the materials um, were developed by myself and uh, five of my teacher prep students. So these are all seniors and um, I, I wanted to make sure that I gave them credit as well because they really have put a lot of uh, effort and work into this uh, with me as well. Materials will be available to access the end of June. And our next steps right now, we're having physical education teachers um, out in the field review the units and lesson plans and give us feedback on those. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerry. Oops. I, uh, I inadvertently jumped ahead a slide, but uh, I've, I've taken us to our, our next um, Colleagues will be speaking. So Cecilia Miller from Thorpe School District, can you please tell us a little bit about the project that, uh, that your team is working on? Sure. Um, so what we have developed is um, sort of a connection to our local tribal culture. Um, so we have um, three of us that have been working on this project um, for the last year or so. Um, and we've been developing units for the elementary, middle and high school level. Um, so if you're willing to switch to the next slide, I'll sort of talk through our process. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do, um, we were sort of going through since time immemorial and looking at that, and we wanted to find some sort of local connection to the Kittitas Valley, um, because it does have a rich history of, of um, Native American uh, history. So our first step was to develop a plan based on uh, Common Core language arts standards and the Washington State Social Studies standards. So we met as a team and we vertically aligned some units 
And we sort of filled in the gaps um, with ELA and social studies and since time immemorial to um, figure out what we needed to address within our own localized area. Um, and then we started to schedule interviews and meet with local tribal members. Um, and then um, COVID happened. And so we've had um, a lot of um, sort of hiccups in meeting with people because we've had to sort of change our trajectory a little bit. Um, but I'm going to run you through the first couple of units. Carly Stickle is also working with us on this, but she's not here today. She has volleyball practice. Um, and then I'm going to let our third person, Alex, speak to the high school unit. So um, for our fourth grade unit, um, Carly chose to focus on the geography of the Kittitas Valley before European settlement. And so they're exploring natural resources, geography, changes caused by westward expansion, um, and they'll study the accounts of those events and develop some writing with this. And it's a two week unit that she's put together um, to do this. And she's working with um, one of our local tribal members to gather maps and those resources um, to be able to share with students, which is really exciting. Um, so that's the fourth grade unit. But next slide. Uh, the middle school unit is also a two week unit um, that's comparing and contrasting the lifestyles of local tribal members historically versus today. Um, and then they'll do a short essay. So um, I've been working with some of our um, local people to discuss what life was like for their parents and their parents prior to now and then how that looks um, to just sort of give kids an understanding that there were people here before and that life has changed, but those people are still here and how their lives have been impacted by settlement and, um, and how they've adapted and what they do now. Um, and the goal with that is to use the fourth grade knowledge to build on and then develop a deeper understanding of the impact on European settlement in the Kittitas Valley. And then sort of looking at how that is today and then how life moves forward for everyone here in the future. And then Alex, would you like to speak to high school? Yes. Hello. So by the time they're in high school, um, we would like to conduct a little bit more in-depth research uh, into the issues facing um, the Kittitas ban uh, here of the Yakima Nation. And the goal is to have students develop a list of questions to conduct oral history interviews, because really a lot of this history is oral. The native history has an oral tradition. So to honor that, and to go close the gap of knowledge uh, that we have as it relates to native history, we'd like students to conduct oral history interviews um, with some tribal representatives and then write a summary paper about that. Um, we wanna build also on the earlier lessons which you heard of uh, by looking also at the geography of Kittitas Valley uh, and then moving on to understand the concept of tribal sovereignty relationship between the US Constitution and, and uh, native treaties. And our hope is that other districts will be able to use some of our oral history uh, templates to be able to conduct similar interviews, perhaps with uh, native communities in their area while being flexible enough to adapt to those different native uh, groups, but while also not treating them as a monolith. And then um, students will conduct an oral history interview with tribal members focusing on current issues facing the tribe. So really this depends upon how many tribal members you can get to participate. If you can get one though, that's great. You can have it be like, an, like a full class interview. If you can get more than that, that's awesome. It kind of depends, but we really just want students to be able to understand that there are natives in your community they're there and there are issues facing their community that they should be aware of. That's it. And then I've got a couple more. Okay. So, uh, so we had some challenges and successes and I wanted to sort of speak to that because our unit involved going out into the community. And um, so COVID created a challenge with that. Um, we did like visiting sites and doing all these things. We have used Zoom as an alternative and we've been able to do some interviews with our, with our stakeholders with that. And those have been really beneficial. Um, and so we're still working on some of our interviews. We don't have everything quite developed just yet, but we should, we're on track to have them up and going in the next few weeks. And we've learned a lot. Our tribal partners have shared a lot of interesting stories and things that I've lived here for 20 years that I didn't know about the area. So it's really neat to hear those things and make those connections. 
Um, and we are, we've gathered a lot of great information to share with our students to connect them to the Native Americans from the Kittitas Valley, which is fantastic. Um, so our next steps, um, we're gonna continue our interviews, upload our lessons, um, as Alex spoke to the interview with the secondary students next year. Um, one of our goals is to have Sahapton, which is a native language signage at our school garden that we're implementing um, and connecting with our partners for that, and a library display with artifacts from the local tribes. And as far as the resources we're developing, our hope is, um, and Alex spoke to it a little bit, that these can be applied to tribes all over the state and that it's not just specific to the Kittitas band, like the, the formatting and the structure can be applicable anywhere and help students make local connections to their local tribes. So. Thank you guys very much. Um, Holly, if you wouldn't mind in the chat window, if you could please put the link to the OER grantee group um, into that chat window. That is the link that um, you guys can use. Um, that'll be the place where all of these great lessons will be uploaded. Uh, some of them that you hear about today are already there um, and others will be arriving sometime within the next couple of months. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Molly Higgins from Tacoma Public Schools. Molly, take us away. Hi, Barbara. Yes, thank you guys so much for, for having us and for hosting this showcase. This is great. Uh, my name is Molly Higgins and I'm a middle school French teacher in Tacoma Public Schools. I am also the district lead and liaison for all the world language teachers in Tacoma, which is about 50 educators. And our main goal through our OER project was um, the Tacoma underwent a uh, textbook adoption phase about four years ago, and the Spanish and French and Korean teams, after reviewing textbook materials, actually decided to forego adopting a formalized textbook curriculum and create our own units and pacing guide, which launched us into a multi-year um, work session of creating these personally, you know, melded and mended units and pacing guides. And so our goal was to contribute to the OER resource um, community by developing our own um, openly licensed supplemental instruction materials for the Spanish, French, and Korean world language teams in levels one and two. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, the project adapted and evolved a little bit more. Um, as Castilia mentioned, when COVID happened, our um, goal kind of grew twofold in not only creating supplemental instructional resources in the form of OER units for French, Spanish, and Korean, but also taking and adapting the existing units and pacing guides that we had created in 2018 and 19, but um, adapting them for a blended learning model to be able to flex with our Tacoma Public Schools world language educators as we um, went from uh, you know, synchronous to asynchronous instruction, remote to hybrid to in-person instruction, and how to continue to use our personally created um, units and pacing guides appropriately in all of those different formats. And so making those available to others was a huge goal of ours. And luckily our instructors were committed to the task and we completed most of our work prior to the start of this 2020-2021 school year last um, July, August, and September. And so um, units are all focused on and based on ACTFL's world language readiness standards, which are the priority standards that exist for world languages. And um, with communication out of the five C's being our priority standard on which everything is, um, is based. Go to the next slide. So the, the, the need this is satisfying, I, I mentioned briefly, but educators would also wanna use this for pretty much everyone in the state who's in a similar boat as Tacoma Public Schools educators who are, we're currently in a hybrid model, hoping to be in more of an in-person model in the fall, but to make it flexible are, is where our resources could be useful and developed or adapted for any given um, district that wants to utilize the resources. And so by taking our existing units and pacing guides, which were created for strictly in-person learning and bolstering them with um, asynchronous materials, more guides, more links or apps or ideas to get kids off screens and away from the computers in addition to all this was the task of our teachers. Um, and the units and pacing guides that we utilized covered every year and every level of language taught in Tacoma. So we, we expanded our project a bit more and had teachers on our world language team working um, to create at least the first eight weeks of the school session um, with asynchronous materials to provide to our teachers, 
um, in every language at every level, opposed to just year one and two, like we originally thought. <laughs> Is it a fair undertaking? I apologize. I'm looking at two screens, Barbara, to be sure that I speak to my, my notes on my second screen as well. So um, the format of our work and where you can find it, it's all just in plain Word document, really easy to download, access, and adapt for yourself, um, and is primarily kind of a teacher-facing document. It looks like your traditional units and pacing guide. Um, I have a, an image on the next slide that you'll see too, with uh, learning targets, timing, formative and summative assessment ideas, et cetera, um, links directly to sites and resources that you can utilize. Um, and ours are actually already published in the Washington OER grantees commons. Um, and I can put the link to not only the world language distance learning units and pacing guides, um, resource materials that I have highlighted on this slide, but per your um, suggestion, Barbara, and a little bit of impetus, I also broke down that one larger resource guide that include all of our documents for all of our languages into one resource link for each individual language additionally. So I kind of have it available in two, two sites, a big bite or a little bite um, on the OER Commons as to kind of what suits you or um, perhaps a little bit easier to, to navigate and, and work with if it's just for one single language. Next slide. So here's just an image of um, what you might expect to see clicking into just the Spanish distance learning units and pacing guides, for example, um, by level um, is and by unit is where you will find the um, Microsoft COCX documents for download um, in, in kind of the right hand pane, as well as an overview of the first four to six weeks of um, the instruction that was created and kind of adapted from there. So as I mentioned before, the, the units and pacing guards are completely customizable, really easy to download and personalize material for your district, your um, uh, standards perhaps, your school and what, what your focuses are, especially if you're working um, across multiple buildings and across multiple levels like we are in Tacoma. It was really easy to communicate around single documents like this. Um, we use Schoology in Tacoma, but I know there are lots of LMS systems out there and these were really easy to implement within our LMS for ease of use and assigning and assessing student work um, and being sure that they align to um, the standards that you're working with for your students. It, it helped make things a little bit more transparent for students, I think, so you're actually having so many things available to them online and uh, in, in folders, the way we organized them was, was, was really useful. So um, like I mentioned, I'll put the, the links to each of the, the resource bundles in the chat after this. I think I just had one more slide, Barbara. So next steps and looking ahead, we um, uh, we met at before the beginning of this school year, like I mentioned back in July, August and September to do the bulk of our work. We um, practiced and actually implemented our work in the first um, six to eight weeks of the school year. It's a really, really busy time. We, we got the world language leadership team of teachers who worked on these units together again in January to assess some data collected from all the world language teachers. The leadership team, I might add, is about 20 teachers, and there's about 50 total teachers who teach world languages in Tacoma, who we represent. Um, and we um, kind of calibrated the data to reprioritize standards for second semester. What was the pacing looking like? How far had different teachers made it? Which ones were just falling off the radar just because of the contact time and how that had changed in our remote model with, with the amount of time we had to work with students. So readapting the existing online resources again to not only meet those calibrated needs, but also to meet uh, with the knowledge that we'd be transitioning to hybrid, um, which we did throughout the month of March was the goal of the language team in January. So we, we re shared documents for all the teachers then, and we're planning on meeting next month to make some summer edits and to work with some of the data collected with how teachers used the resources, um, if at all, during this crazy, crazy school year. So we're looking forward to some end of year feedback that I'll be collecting this month to work with next month and in the years ahead. So a great question. So uh, let's move over to Seattle Public Schools. Uh, 
Thad Williams is leading that project. He actually could not be with us today, so I have a, a video recording from him, but I did want to give you a bit of context about the project that they're working with. Um, keeping in that world languages vein, uh, and this time with a, a social studies bent, um, his team at Seattle, um, they're actually translating the state we're in Washington, which is a resource that was created by the uh, League of Women Voters of Washington, all about Washington state history. Um, and they're translating it into Spanish, Japanese, and um, Chinese. Um, also taking on portions of the Since Time Immemorial curriculum. Um, and adding this year uh, high school courses and, and working with translating and adapting work from Seattle Civil Rights and uh, Labor History Labor History Project. Excuse me. All right, and uh, hopefully everybody keep your fingers crossed. We're going to see if this video will uh, will work for us. And a quick thumbs up if you're hearing sound. Hello, everyone. I'm Thad Williams, the program manager for dual language and world language in Seattle Public Schools. We've had the opportunity to have the OER grant from OSPI. Thank you very much, OSPI, this past year. We really we have um, yes. kind of dug in in three different areas of work. And we have a team with our Spanish language programming and then also our Chinese language programming that has been really leading the way in this work. And so we've continued to focus on the state we're in, textbook and curriculum. A few areas there needed continual translation. So we've continued to do that. That's That'll be available on the OER Commons webpage, as well as a project I'm, I'm most excited about because it involves our high school dual language students from Chief South International High School is we found as a district there was a need to have some audio versions of each chapter available in Spanish. And so we've been working with a team of seven students to record each chapter sort of in a read aloud format. And I'm just really excited and inspired by their work and how high quality it is, as well as that that will be available statewide uh, for any student who might benefit from hearing the text read aloud in Spanish, whether that's while they're reading through it or whether it's just something as they still, um, as a student develop their reading and their literacy skills, now have that audio support available. So really thankful to our students who have been working really hard on that despite everything else they're doing. We also have focused on the University of Washington Civil Rights Project this year and have translated materials within that um, group of work. And you'll hear more from one of our teachers about that shortly. And then we've also continued to focus some on the Since Time and Memorial resources. And we're hopeful that we know some of that's gonna be getting translated as well into Spanish. And so we're hopeful we can continue that work with our Chinese team, as well as you know make sure that there's some alignment between the resources we've created and new resources. So it's been a great uh, honor and privilege to have this grant. And I'm gonna now turn it over to some of my colleagues who will share a little bit more about our work. Barbara, they want to know if Hello, you can get a link this is to the YouTube Sanchez. video. I'm teaching in Chief South International High School, and I'm working on the OER project. In this project, I'm translating to Spanish, uh, uh, the, to Spanish, the Washington, the state we are in, and also I'm translating the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project of the University of Washington. I would like to focus on the Seattle Civil Rights translations, and this project includes, as shown in the in, in the screen, a student activist, Seattle Civil Rights History, movement, and Seattle segregation history. I would like to stand out three different things in this project. The use of Spanish language as a teacher working in the Spanish immersion department. I have mostly Latino students and the project gives them a framework of enhancing their Spanish academic skills. It's local history. Studying the story of the civil rights in Washington state allow my student to contextualize what's happening now in the United States and having a better understanding about the civil rights activism uh, nowadays. And also feeling proud, the story of the Chicano movement provides an excellent narrative about the Latino fight for the right 
and encourage my students to feel proud about their ancestors in Washington State. Thank you so much. I am a middle school immersion teacher teaching social studies to 6th, 7th and 8th grade Chinese immersion students. In my experience participating in the OER project, I think OER project gives teachers the opportunity to investigate and identify materials that allow to be translated and shared across schools and districts finding appropriate materials for U.S. history and Washington state history in Chinese has always been challenging. In the past two years, I worked with two other Chinese world language teachers to form a group of three. Our team had been working on translating the state we're in and seems time immemorial. I'm able to use all the translated material in my classes majorly for student reading comprehension practice and class textbook for content instruction. I clearly see the benefit of having these materials. When I was collaborating with immersion educators from other districts, I was glad to share these resources with them. Our high school Chinese world language teachers can also use them for their thematic teaching in Chinese. And ELL teachers truly appreciate to have these materials for their students whose first language is Chinese. I would love to see that we can continue making these resources available to create more access for educators and students in different forms of language education. Hello, my name is Fatima Garnica. I am a sophomore at Chief South International High School. Ever since I was in sixth grade, I have been enrolled in the dual language program and I have been so thankful to be able to be in this program because I have gained so much knowledge and opportunities from it. This audio recording project has been one of the many opportunities that I have gotten for being bilingual. My Spanish teacher, Mr. Lopez Chavez, introduced this project to us saying that we would have to read an article in Spanish and record ourselves. And by doing that, we would be getting paid. Before actually starting to record myself reading the article, I practiced as much as I could reading it out loud. Reading it out loud really helped me become more comfortable and it made my reading flow more. The reason I wanted to do this project was because I would be helping kids understand their reading more by reading it myself and they wouldn't have a difficult time understanding it. It would also be a really good way to practice my reading skills in Spanish. I consider myself a very fluent Spanish speaker, but by doing this, I think it would just make it better for me to practice. And not only that, but I would be getting paid for something that comes naturally to me, which is something really good and something I appreciate a lot. The people I hope get a chance to listen to these recordings would be Spanish-speaking students, not only in the dual language program, but just in general. I think it would be a really good way for me to help kids who don't understand, and then that way I could help them read a little more and things will be easier for them. I would definitely want to do more projects like this in the future. I think it's a really good way for us as students to practice our reading skills. Not only that, but we're getting paid for something that comes naturally to us. And I think it's a really good way for Seattle Public Schools to thank us because we're putting time and effort in this. And I would love to participate in another project like this. Being able to use my reading skills in this project made me feel really thankful because not many people have the opportunity to be bilingual, but I was lucky enough to be bilingual, to be able to speak two languages. I think that being bilingual is honestly one of the biggest blessings because it can open so many new doors it can open so many opportunities not only in college but in life so I feel super thankful to the fact that I'm bilingual. I want to use my bilingual skills as much as possible to help those in need especially Spanish-speaking people that don't speak English. Many of them come to this new country without the English language and that can be very frightening so I want to get a chance to help those people as much as I can in any way possible. All right, and lastly, um, bringing us home, I'm gonna pass it over to, um, to Pranjali, who'll talk a little bit about the Regional STEM Materials Collaborative. Pranjali, it's all you. Thank, thank you, Barbara, thank you. So, um, Haley, we can go to the next slide. Um, my name's Pranjali Upadhyay. I'm the Integrated Curriculum Coordinator uh, at ESD 112 in Southwest Washington. 
And so for our project, um, which has been um, going on for, it's gonna be five years this summer, um, our goal was to support teachers and now um, parents with the past year and how we've changed and shifted in implementing high quality STEM for students. Um, we're hoping to provide units and resources that help parents and teachers um, address our next generation science standards. And we're also really interested in facilitating integrated learning experiences, which are focused around phenomenon that are local, that are real, and that also bring in the perspectives and stories of culturally and ethnically diverse peoples and communities. So that's been kind of a, a shift for us this year um, has been to actually in our STEM curriculum to include some of the activism and some of the um, uh, strengths that have been uh, leveraged by communities of color to solve real problems that are happening locally. So um, that's kind of our goal here. And Holly, we can move on. Thank you so much. Um, so here we have a storyline development process that I will not go into depth in, but essentially um, this is a process that we engage in in order to actually create a STEM storyline. And it involves um, standards alignment, um, thinking about local phenomenon that would be engaging to the age group that we're creating the curriculum from, uh, for, and then also um, using uh, other OER resources and bringing in um, other uh, openly licensed resources and activities into our units to, to support teachers in doing STEM in their classrooms. We can go next, Holly, thank you. So um, for this year, we have uh, a couple different types of resources we're creating. We have our STEM storylines, which are longer 10 week long units that are project-based learning oriented and anchored around a phenomenon. Um, and then we have our STEM mini projects, which are more intended for hybrid learning or even learning at home that we've been working on. And that, has, um, that was a response to COVID, trying to create resources that parents could use um, at home to leverage what uh, assets there are in the home environment and also um, things teachers could use in a hybrid environment. We can move on, Holly. Thank you. So here's just a, a, a quick snapshot of um, some of our storyline work. So we have uh, teacher guides that are pretty um, robust that have a series of lessons um, turned into a unit. And we also have a lot of uh, slides and supporting teachers materials that we work very hard on so that teachers are not having to do a lot of the planning um, when it comes to the day-to-day -day implementation. We can move on, Holly. Thank you so much. And then our STEM mini projects are a little bit more simple and they have um, a lesson plan format essentially, and um, also coming with um, some slideshows and videos and other things that students can explore and uh, parents can facilitate at home, activities that parents can facilitate at home. So, um, Let's see, what else did I wanna say? So our resources are uh, actually on uh, the OER hub. There's uh, a couple more, actually several more that are going to be on there by um, next month. And then we also have our units that are uploaded on our stemmaterials.org page. And Barbara, that was pretty quick, but I knew that we were kind of uh, running out of time a little bit. So um, thank you so much. Uh, we're just really grateful to be able to be a part of this really cool project and to create resources that help um, every child have access to high quality learning. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Pranjali. Much appreciated. All right. Um, so I am I am hoping that, um, Holly, you've been adding links to a lot of these uh, locations into the chat window. Um, I know we had a question come up about um, the recording. So yes, I, I will be happy to provide a link to uh, the Seattle uh, recording as well as um, a link to uh, Kathy's uh, financial literacy recording. Um, and in fact, this whole session that we're having now is recorded also. So um, you will have access to all of that material. I do want to mention really briefly that uh, the next cycle of the 21-22 uh, OER project grant uh, just became available on iGrants. 
Uh, proposals are due on May 27th. Uh, this is a grant that runs from July 1st through June 30th of next year. And I will make this slide deck available so you will also have a, a link to a, a grant walkthrough to talk a little bit about the, uh, the proposal and the requirements. Um, and we also have links for you to download the, um, the actual request for proposals. In fact, Holly, I think I provided both of those links to you. If you wouldn't mind popping those into chat for folks as well, they will have access to those. And I would like to leave you with all of uh, my contact information, uh, but I also want to take a moment to thank all of our wonderful grantees for all the incredibly hard work that they've done, uh, especially given the circumstances of this last year. We do have a couple of minutes left. If there are any questions in the chat window that have popped up, Holly, that we can address really quickly, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer those for folks while we have the whole group here. No questions have come up. A lot of people saying that it's very amazing and looks awesome. That is great to hear. Um, I will be happy to stick around for a few minutes afterwards if anyone would like to hang on and, uh, and chat a little bit about any of these resources. But I do want to honor everyone's time and um, really appreciate you spending the afternoon with us. Thank you again uh, to all of our wonderful grantees and presenters. Um, the work you've done is, is fantastic, and please know that it is getting shared broadly and is, is much appreciated. So thank you to everybody. Have a great afternoon, and um, please visit us on the Washington OER Hub. I am stopping recording.